Good morning, everybody. Welcome to week five, lesson one for year six maths. This week, our focus is all about time. And today we're looking specifically at timetables. So today we are learning to read and use timetables. The first thing we need to recognize is that timetables order events chronologically. That means ordered based on time. So usually timetables order things um, from the earliest to the latest, but they're not just ordered randomly, they're ordered chronologically, which like chrono means time and logically means, you know, logically. So ordered logically according to their time. And usually we start with the earliest event going to the latest. The next thing which is really important to understand is that timetables are typically structured using columns, rows, and headings. And that becomes really important in uh, navigating a timetable. Uh, also, I'd like you to recognize that timetables are used in a variety of situations and that they can come in a variety of formats as well. So not all timetables look the same. That's where it becomes really important to be able to read using columns, rows, and headings, being able to navigate um, that because they do differ. So let's have a look at some different timetables. So here I've got a simple timetable, which is going to be a sample, and it's going to show us the different elements or different parts of a regular kind of normal timetable. Um, the first one, which is probably the most important to start off with, is the heading. So I want to make sure that the timetable that I'm looking at is going to answer the questions that I want, that it's not for something completely different, and also that it's up to date as well. So this one here says 2021. If it says 2019, you know, that information might have been updated year to year. Um, sometimes it might even have a little bit of a um, text down here or somewhere else on the page saying, you know, updated, last updated. Um, so you want to make sure that um, you're looking at the right kind of timetable. So heading is extremely important when you're using or even writing a timetable. The next thing you want to look at is the table itself. And the table is split into columns, which go down uh, or vertically and rows which go across or horizontally. So it's split into these uh, columns here. So each day has a column um, and each row has a time slot. So the time slots here, I can see they're an hour long. So nine to 10, 10 to 11 and so on. Um, the latest time slot is uh, one to two. So these times are arranged chronologically. So starting with the earliest time slots, going to the latest. And the days obviously are arranged chronologically as well. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. That's the order of the days in the week. So it's all ordered chronologically. Um, then within the timetable, I have the, the various events. So before I start kind of just looking at this timetable, I want to see why am I, um, what information do I want to get out of it? So do I want to know what's happening at a particular time on a particular day? Or do I want to know, you know what time is a particular event on so I can attend it or go to it. So let's say I want to know what's happening on Tuesday at uh, between one and two o'clock. So I go across here on the headings um, and the columns. So this is my headings, I should say. I should this is also a heading as well. Uh, Tuesday is here. So I've got Tuesday and then I'm going to go down to, uh, did I say one to two o'clock? Uh, one to two o'clock, let's say it is. It's quiet. So that's what's happening then. So I've got some free time. Um, and let's say I live near the community hall. I want to go do something on Tuesday between one and two o'clock. I could join the choir. Um, let's say I want to do uh, judo. What I can do is I can kind of look through this timetable. So I'm going to find the event. So I'm going to go, okay, well, is it, let's switch colors. There's a judo here, judo here, and here. So it's happening on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. Then, I, so I'm going to the most general information first, then I find out what time it is. So I go, okay, wait a second. Well, it's happening between one and two on a Monday. So these two pieces of time information, Monday and the time slot are what I obviously need to pinpoint um, when this is happening. Um, Tuesday here, and it's happening between 11 and 12. And judo also happens on a Thursday and it happens between 10 and 11. So then I'd sort of check, well, you know, am I available between 10 and 11 on a Thursday to go do judo and so on? That's 
essentially how you read a timetable. It's really important that you uh, scroll across so you're not kind of jumping down here. Um, the lines should help you, but as we will see, timetables differ in format. So it's really important that you can line up the time and the date or the day with the particular event or activity. Okay, so here's something you probably don't see very often these days. Um, this was more relevant uh, maybe 20, 30 years ago, probably maybe 20 years ago even. Um, this is a television timetable or a television schedule. So here you can see that we've got the date, and this is actually from 1984, so it's quite old. Um, the date here, it says this is Thursday, the 25th of October, which actually happens to be my birthday. Um, and you can see here that we've got all the TV shows. So let's go to channel two, which I think is ABC. Uh, 8 p.m. to Sesame Street. At nine o'clock, there's um, Young Viewers. 9.30, Play School, and so on. So all the times are all organized chronologically, so from earliest to latest. Um, now, the thing with this timetable is there aren't lines kind of separating each of the uh, different columns. That's because obviously you can have shows that um, you know, finish earlier than other shows. So that's one of the disadvantages of this timetable is that it's hard to, you have to basically go, okay, let's see, I want to watch Sesame Street at three. Um, what else is happening at three o'clock? Well, here I've got, you know, daytime serials are happening at, between uh, 1.30 and four. Uh, here I've got the Rockford Files. Oh my gosh, this is old, three o'clock. Uh, I think Channel Zero already is, is finished by then. So that's like a, a we had, didn't have 24 hour TV, sometimes channels finished early. And three o'clock here, we've got, well, the tennis is going on between 12 and four. Now let's compare that timetable from the 80s to a timetable you know, from a more recent time. So here I've got a screenshot of a TV guide, which is a type of timetable, uh, accessing it on an iPad, and the time here is 408. And up the top here on this ribbon here, I can see the different days. So this is today, or whenever this was, screenshot was taken, uh, tomorrow, Wednesday the 15th, Thursday the 16th, and so on. It's actually brought me to the time. So the time here is 408, and I can see the different channels um, on each row. So you've got nine, Fox One, ABC, and so on, all the way down to channel seven. Um, then up here in this kind of uh, heading, I can see the different times. So it's brought me to 408. Then I can see a time slot for uh, 4.30, 5 o'clock, 5.30, 6 o'clock. So the, it kind of segments it based on, on the half hour, because that's roughly kind of how it's how long you know, a standard TV show maybe runs for a half an hour or an hour. Um, and I don't actually have the lines going down like I did on that last, uh, the first timetable we looked at. Um, and that's because uh, sometimes shows you know, run between um, you know, 4.30 and 5.30, whereas others might start at five o'clock. So let's go down here, um, Channel 7 News um, it's on at the moment, and it finishes at five o'clock, so it's the seven news at four. And then after it, I can see we've got um, the Chase Australia. Now, meanwhile here, uh, this show Better Homes and Gardens on the Lifestyle Channel, it started at 4.15 and it goes to 5.30. So it's gonna cut into the Chase as well, um, if you were to watch that. Now, it's not so relevant these days um, because a lot of you know TV is recorded, but things like you know, live news, um, sporting events, you know, Olympic opening ceremony, then this is probably where it's you'd be accessing this more. Uh, or maybe if you've got a day at home and you, you know, kind of a little bit bored and you're like, oh, what's on TV today? So there you go. Okay, now here's a timetable you might be a little more familiar with. This is our term two timetable time from last term. Um, so up here I've got the days of the week, and then I've got different time slots. So eight to nine, um, nine to ten, and so on. Now the time slot's going to differ based on our school day, um, but you can see here, you know, generally between this um, 11.30 and one o'clock time, we have maths going across here. Sometimes um, there are different uh, timetables based on whether it's an odd week or an even week. So we have assembly in an odd week here in, time, in term two. Um, again, the events are ordered chronologically, so from the earliest up here, from eight o'clock all the way down to the latest, which is 4.30.
Now, let's look at a gym timetable and answer some questions from it. So similar to our class timetable, the days of the week were up the top here, and then the times, starting from the earliest, going down to the latest, are the rows. So the days of the week are the columns, and the times are the rows. So let's say I want to take a class on Wednesday between 7 and 8 p.m. What classes are available? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Wednesday, scroll down. Now I know that's, that's at 8 p.m. is later in the day. Oh, sorry, 7 to 8 p.m. is later in the day. So here I've got this um, row here. And there's actually three classes available um, in that 7 p.m. time slot. So I'm assuming that the time slots are an hour. So 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. So you could do, what's this, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Muay Thai, or CUT. Now I've got this key over here which tells me what this means. That's daily ultimate training. So it's the different uh, classes I could take, and I can't obviously take them at the same time, um, but it's, it shows that there's three classes available in that time slot. Um, what days is MMA skills offered? Um, so here I can see MMA skills. Now they've color coded this as well to make it easier for people to read. So that it's black and white. Um, MMA skills here. Now this one's conditioning, so that's not right. This one here. Um, and then here it's actually split the weekend off as well. So we've got the weekday schedule and then we've got a, a weekend schedule. And now the weekend schedule is obviously shorter because maybe the gym closes or um, it's more expensive to run those classes. So they only offer it for the morning. Um, so the days I could do it are Tuesday up here, and let's just go up here, it's the day is Thursday. And lastly, on Tuesday, can I do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and DUT Strength? Okay, so let's have a look. So Tuesday, well, I can do DUT Strength at 5 p.m., and then straight after that at 6 p.m., I can do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Now they also have a DUT strengths class at the same time. Um, I can't obviously do them both at the same time. Um, so I've got two classes back to back there. Now this is a, a different type of gym timetable. This is for a specific program, which has T40, which I'm not too sure what that is. But instead of putting the days of the week up here, they put them um, as the rows and then the times are the columns. Um, so here I can go, you know, also, you can see there's a kind of pattern here, which is kind of cool. Um, so Monday, they just offer Annihilator. Um, it starts at 5.20, and I assume it kind of finishes before 6.30. Um, just a different way of organizing the times and uh, days of the week. Now, obviously, um, this probably makes more sense to have the times on uh, this part here as the, the rows. Uh, if you have a lot of times in the day, because they're only you know, seven days of the week, so you're only really going to have seven columns at uh, maximum. Um, so that's one sort of consideration if you're building a timetable. Here we've got a cinema timetable. So um, this is a small cinema, I think it's in Mount Bula, which is like a ski resort. Um, and we can see the days of the week. We can see the movies here. And then we actually put the times are put in um, the rows here. So the, the, the times actually aren't um, kind of headings for that row, um, they're within the row. So uh, let's answer some questions about that. So can I see Toy Story 4 on the weekend? All right, so I'm going to jump to the weekend, which is you know, Saturday and Sunday, and then I'm going to go to Toy Story 4. I actually can even start at Toy Story 4. I'll scroll across um, this way, no and no. So no. All right, how many sessions of The Lion King are there? So I'm going to go down to The Lion King, which is here. One, two, three, four, five. Nice and simple. Um, what time will I get out of the cinema if I watch Spider-Man Far From Home on Wednesday, the 21st of August? So again, I'm going to scroll down to Spider-Man. Um, and then go across and then check up oh, this is Wednesday now it starts at 8 30 p.m. and it goes for two hours and nine minutes now let's just say there's no um, uh, trailers at the start or no commercials you know this is a small cinema so they're just going to play the movie and then the lights are going to come on um, so I'm going to have to calculate the elapsed time there so I'm going to add my two hours first the two hours um, 
8 o'clock plus 2 hours is going to be 10 o'clock. Um, the minutes stay the same, so it's going to be 10.30. Then I add the minutes, so it's going to be 10.39 is when the lights are going to come on. PM. Okay, and the last one, can I see the Lion King and Fast and Furious Hobbs and Shaw on the same day? So here we've got um, the Lion King and Fast and Furious. So scrolling across, they're not on the same day on Monday or not even showing on Tuesday. Not even, well, Fast and Furious isn't showing on Wednesday. Ah, uh, here we go. We've got uh, Thursday, um, Lion King starts at 6 and Fast and Furious starts at 8.30. The Lion King, now I want to make sure um, the, Lion, the Lion King finishes before Fast and Furious starts. So I'm going to add an hour on here. This shows the duration or the, the length of the movie. Um, so an hour uh, plus six, so it's going to be 7 p.m. And then add the minutes on, 7.58. Then there's a bit of time to you know, go to the candy bar or go to the toilet. And then the, uh, Fast and Furious starts at 8.30. So yeah, I can definitely see those two movies on Thursday the 22nd. Okay, now it's a little more relevant for the whole, you know, last week, I guess, when you're watching this. Um, this is the Tokyo 2020 Olympic softball schedule. Um, and you can see here, it's again, a different format. It is chronological, but now we've got the um, days and the dates um, kind of grouping, um, going down this way as rows. Then we've got the names of the countries. So we've got you know, visitor country or home country. Um, I'm not entirely sure why that says home there because these aren't all home countries, but uh, basically the two teams. Yep, so we've got Australia, and Japan. And then within this row, I have these kind of sub rows, so these smaller rows. And these are the times again, arranged chronologically. So the earliest to the latest, so nine o'clock, uh, midday, 12 o'clock, and here we've actually got 24 hour time. So it's uh, 1500 hours or 3 p.m. Now, if you're not too familiar with 24 hour time, um, I suggest you go and watch the year five video on Monday because there's a whole lesson on it. Um, if you are familiar with it, then don't worry, don't bother. Okay, so let's look at some of these questions here. So what time and date is Italy versus Canada? Well, here I want to know, um, I'm looking for this kind of matchup, Italy versus Canada. So I'm going to look at the teams first. So I'm going to scroll down and look for Italy. So Italy versus America, um, Italy versus Australia, Italy versus Mexico. Oh, well, I actually can't find Italy versus Canada, but I can find Canada versus Italy. So here we go. So it's happening on the 22nd of July, and it's happening at uh, 14.30, which is 2.30 p.m. Uh, number two, which games does Australia play in the afternoon or evening? Um, so here I'm going to look for Australia. Now this one's at nine o'clock in the morning. So this one here is at uh, 1500 hours, which is 3 p.m. So that's in the evening. So Italy versus Australia is one of them. Uh, this one here is in the morning. This one here is in the morning. And this one here is in the evening because it starts at uh, 2000 hours, which is 8 p.m. So it's, the two games are Italy versus Australia and Mexico versus Australia. Uh, I have to work in the evenings is question three. Can I still watch Japan versus America? So let's go to um, Japan versus, let's go Japan. It's nice and easy to find Japan, Japan, Japan versus USA. It's on at 10 a.m. So yes, I can watch that. And lastly, um, I get home from work at 9 p.m. on Mondays, can I watch all of the Mexico versus Australia match live? So four o'clock, now all these questions are, you know, um, preface on the assumption that it is, you're watching these live, you're not just watching a recording. Um, so I get home at nine o'clock on Monday. So let's go to Monday, which is here, Monday the 26th. I get home at 9 p.m. Um, but this game here, Mexico versus Australia, it starts at 20, 100 hours, which is 8 p.m. So no, I'll miss some of that game. So timetables, um, we've seen they can be used for live TV programs, for cinemas. We're gonna look at transport timetables tomorrow because that's a whole other can of worms. Uh, you know, in the world of work, at school, in industry and business, for conferences, meetings and events, and gyms, and so many other things as well. We're only to scratch the surface today.
So here are the main ideas from today. Um, the first one is that timetables order events chronologically, so from the earliest event to the latest event, um, and the days of the week, you know, the earlier day of the week, so Monday, then Tuesday, then Wednesday, Thursday, etc. Um, when you're reading a timetable, make sure you read the title of the timetable so you know you're, you're reading the right timetable for you. And then also use the columns, rows, and the headings um, to pinpoint that information. Um, now here, there's kind of two situations you know, might commonly use a timetable, and that's to find an event um, or to find out what's on at a particular time. Um, if you're trying to find an event, firstly, just find that event in the timetable. Then you um, go across to where the day and date information is, then the time it's on. Now, the reason I prefer this uh, method is starting with the most general and going to the most specific. Um, the day and date, um, they're unambiguous. So you've got uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but with the time, that can be ambiguous because you can have 10 a.m. on a Tuesday, 10 a.m. on a Wednesday, 10 a.m. on a Thursday. So I always prefer to get this part of information right, the day and date first, then you go to the time. Um, same with finding out what's on at a time. Um, again, go to the most general, find the day and date, then the time, and then you obviously identify you know, um, what event's happening there by kind of pinpointing um, those two pieces of information. Um, second last, timetables are used in a variety of situations, as we've, as we've seen. You can really use them for anything involving time and events. And lastly, they come in a variety of formats as well. Um, so it's just being able to recognize that yep, there are different types of timetables and you really do need to use those skills of reading headings, columns, rows, and titles to be able to navigate them. Okay, guys, thank you for your time today. I'll see you tomorrow for lesson two on transport timetables. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. This is week five, lesson two for year six maths. Today we're looking at transport timetables. So I thought I'd dedicate a whole lesson to this because there are so many different transport timetables um, and they can be a little bit tricky as well. So we're gonna go through some of those pitfalls today. So today you're learning to use and read transport timetables. Um, like yesterday, you need to recognize that timetables order events chronologically. So here the events are you know, when a particular form of transport arrives, whether that's a bus, a train, a ferry, or a plane. We're going to read those different types of timetables. Um, identifying the departure and arrival time of your form of transport is extremely important. And again, using titles, columns, rows, and headings to pinpoint the information you need. Now, firstly, let's look at a bus timetable. So here, I know this is leaving from the Sydney airport. It's the domestic terminal, so that means it's flying within Australia, and it's terminal three. Um, this is the bus stop number as well. So each of the bus stops has a number or um, some way of identifying it as well. So this bus stop will probably be called you know, Sydney Airport Terminal 3 Domestic. Maybe further down the road, um, you might have like Reardon Street or um, Central Station. Um, so they all have kind of names to identify them. Um, now I can see this is the Monday to Friday timetable. So again, I'm just looking at the headings first. So I wanna make sure that A, this is the right bus and B, I'm looking at the right days as well. So here's Monday to Friday. Now further down, I did have to make this bigger. Um, there's actually a Saturday and Sunday timetable as well, which runs differently. So the buses run less frequently on those days. Um, now let's go to the timetable itself. Now it looks different to the ones we looked at yesterday. This is more of a kind of list view. So here I can see the heading, which is time. It's very small. And all the times going down here, starting with uh, zero or 29, which is 4.29 a.m. Goes all the way down here, keeps on going. And actually they use 24 hour time here as well. So you can see here, we've got 13.38, 17.25, 5.25 p.m. Um, possibly they don't have enough room to write a.m. and p.m. because it's a very small font, but also recognizing, you know, we've got international travelers as well. Um, might be making a connection um, to the domestic airport, catching a bus. Um, and we know that uh, 24 hour time is used very commonly internationally. It's actually used in most countries around the world. Um, now, next I can see the route, which is the bus route. So um, all of these buses have a number. So we've got a 420 here. I've got a 400. Um, 
and I think that's it's 420 and 400 actually yeah so they will go either kind of similar or um, very different um, bus routes so different stops so I want to make sure I catch the right one so here it actually tells me the destination so the 420 goes to East Gardens on this one um, or this 420 actually goes to Burwood so they might have different destinations or different um, termination points uh, the 400 goes to Terminal 1 so you need to kind of look at all that information um, and then obviously select which uh, bus is right for me. So imagine I arrived um, at the bus stop at 10 o'clock. So I wouldn't even have to bother with all this information above them at 10 o'clock. Um, and I want to catch the 4.20 to Burwood. I'd have to wait 17 minutes and then I could catch the 10 at 17, um, 4.20 to Burwood. Um, over here, I've included um, stand information. So we've got stand B, stand C, stand D. Now this is a situation where you might be in the city and there's a lot of buses um, or at central station so there's actually different stands for different buses so you want to be at the right stand um, otherwise the bus you know the bus won't arrive it'll still stand and you won't get picked up um, so here you can see that stand c um, these buses to corvelli leave from there so 338 339 um, 372 and 374 to coogee and so on um, now I actually included this down here i haven't even seen this um, it must be in the city somewhere. Um, what is it? Town Hall Station. So this actually gives you live information about where these buses are. So I'm catching the M52 to Parramatta, which I've actually caught before, um, and it tells me when it's arriving. So it says it's arriving now. This is a very small one, so apologies for that. And it also shows me how many passengers are on there. So that's kind of new information um, with real-time data going into that. Um, here is a bus timetable that kind of presents similar to the timetables we've seen before. Um, going down here, I've got the locations. So these are the destinations. The, the top one is the first destination, or basically the departure point, where it's leaving from. Um, after Katoomba, it would go to the Arts Centre, then to the Gingerbread House, and so on. And it actually comes back to Katoomba at the end. Um, then I see all my times here as well. So these times are, these are in AM, PM time, but they haven't included the AM and PM. Um, and you can see here that you know it leaves at 9.15, then it only takes a minute to get to the arts corner, another minute to get to Gingerbread House and so on. So it seems like there's a lot of stops. Now I might look at a bigger timetable now because this is quite small to work with. Here we've got the Perth Explorer, which is like a tourist bus. It's one of the hop on hop off buses where um, you pay a certain amount, you pay for a ticket in a day, you can, um, and it kind of takes you to different attractions around the city so you can get on um, at one, Stop and you're like, oh, I'm interested in this museum, I'll get off and then get back on and I'll take you somewhere else. So it's kind of a tourist bus. Um, so here we've got the tour stops. Um, so it starts off from Barrack Street, um, Jetty and Elizabeth Key. Um, the next stop is Hay Street and so on, all the way down to Kings Park down here. It has a column for attractions as well. So this is tourist information. So people are like, oh, I want to do some shopping. Well, do you know what? I might get off at 471 Hay Street because there's shops there. Or I want to go to a casino, I might go to Crown Perth. Yep, and there's a casino there. Um, here we can see that the buses are still in their columns. So uh, bus one um, leaves from Barrack Street Jetty at 9.15 a.m. Then it goes to Hay Street and it gets there at 9.20 a.m. and so on. Then bus two is the next bus to arrive, arrives at 10.15 a.m. and then goes this way as well. Yep. So it's following the same route each time, um, stopping at all the stops I can see, because I can see times at all these stops. So it just kind of follows the same circle. I think it's actually a circle motion. Okay, so let's answer some questions about this timetable. So if I catch the 115 bus from Barrack Street Jetty, what time will I arrive at the Perth Mint? So Barrack Street Jetty is here, and I'm gonna scroll down here, and the Perth Mint is number six, okay? So if I leave the uh, Barrack Street Jetty at 1.15, which is this time here, and I, what time I arrive at the Perth Mint, so the Perth Mint was like a yellow color. So here, and I'm just gonna double check by going across. I would arrive at 1.55 p.m. What is the latest bus I can catch from the Cultural Center to get to Kings Park? So here I start with my tour stops again. Cultural Center is number three. Kings Park is number seven. And what's the latest bus? So I'm going to go all the way to the right. 
um, because these are the latest buses in the day. So here, Cultural Centre, 325. And I'm just going to check that stops at Kings Park. It does. So the latest bus I can catch is at 325. If I miss the 1225 bus at the Cultural Centre, how long will it take? How, sorry, how long will I have to wait for the next one? So I've got 1225 and Cultural Centre. So I'm going to go to Cultural Centre again and then scroll across. 1225 is here. And then how long will I have to wait for the next one? Well, the next one is going to be right here. So I've got 1225 and then 125. The only thing that's changed is the hours. So it's an hour difference. So these buses, if I look even broader, I can see these buses come on the hour. Yep, so they're always um, on the hour and then 25 minutes. So 9.25, 10.25 and so on. How long is the ride from 471 Hay Street to Kings Park? So I've got my tour stop here, 471 Hay Street, and Kings Park is number seven. So let's say we do the one at, bus number one at 9.20, gets to Kings Park at 10.20, well, that's an hour difference. And lastly, what attractions are at Crown Perth? So I'm gonna go to Crown Perth, it's number, number five here, and the attractions are in this column. So there's a casino, there's restaurants, hotels, and there's Birdswood Park. Let's look at a train timetable. Now, these are a little bit trickier sometimes. Um, here, I've got the T4 Eastern Suburbs in Illawarra line, um, and it's going from Waterfall to Bondi Junction. So it's going city bound. Um, you want to make sure when you're looking at these timetables, particularly for train timetables, that it's going in the right direction. Because if you have a train line, you actually have oh, two train lines. Um, so in this case, you have one going towards the city and one going away from the city. Um, here I've got all the stations and here I've got the times. Now this is um, just for the one day. Um, see how I don't have any um, days in this bit here? Um, these are the different trains. So this is like train one, two, three, four, and so on. Or well, the first train, second train, third train, fourth train. Okay, I catch the 8.30 p.m. train from Waterfall. So I'm going to find Waterfall. What time will I arrive at Janali? So let's go across here. Now this is in 24 hour time. So I need to make those conversions between 24 hour and a.m. p.m. time. It's very important to have that skill. Um, here I know that uh, 20 hundred hours is 8 p.m. So 20.30 is 8.30. And what time will I arrive at Janali? Well, Janali, I have to find the station. So Janali is here. And I'm going to go across this way and match it up. Now, here they actually have the gray and white um, shading as well to kind of help your eye track across. So it's going to arrive at 20.48 or 8.48 p.m. I missed the 7.50 p.m. train from Cronulla to Hurstville. What time is the next train I can catch? So 7.50 p.m. from Cronulla. So I'm going to go to Cronulla first. Here we go, 7.50 p.m. Uh, and I want to go to Hurstville, which is all the way down the bottom here. So Cronulla, I'll circle that one as well. Cronulla to Hurstville. What's the next train I can catch? Well, there isn't actually a train at this time. Um, these dotted lines mean that this train has limited stops. So it, it goes from Waterfall, Heathcote, Engadine, and Loftus, then it skips all these stations and goes to Sutherland. So if you're waiting at that platform, that train will just speed by. You couldn't hop on it. It's not going to open its doors. Just, it's kind of like an express train. Um, also just kind of helps the flow of trains. So typically stations with uh, you know, where more passengers get on um, have more trains stopping at them, whereas Cronulla might be you know, a relatively quiet station compared to some of these others. So I can't get one for this second train, so I'm going to go across here. So I've got... Um, 20.05 or 8.05, but there's no stop at Hurstville. So this train, it uh, terminates at Sutherland. There's no um, there's no uh, train stopping at Hurstville there. So I have to keep going even further across. So let's try 8.20. So I've got um, 8.20 here, 20.20, and I go down, oh, excellent. So it stops at uh, 20.50. So the next train I can catch from Cronulla to Hurstville is gonna be this 8.20 train here. 
does the T4 train always stop at Sutherland? Okay, so this is our T4 line. Um, I find Sutherland, which is just here. And yes, 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 yes. And yes, yep, it does always stop there. So that must be a major station. And lastly, number four, what is the latest train I can catch from Heathcote to Hurstville? So here I'm going to find Heathcote in my stations. Um, and then I'm going to find Hurstville, which is the last one. So the latest train, so the latest train leaving from Hurst from Heathcote is 8.35 because uh, here there's no more trains stopping there um, on this line. So we've got 8.35 and it does stop at Hurstville, so 2100 hours or 9 p.m. Now, all of this information um, in terms of reading a static timetable with rows and columns, it has kind of been disrupted in the last maybe 15, 10 years with the arrival of transport apps and smartphones. So one of the most common uh, transport apps used in Sydney is TripView. And here's some screenshots from TripView. So it actually um, makes it a lot easier to know um, whether a train is gonna stop at your station, what time it's arriving, and it actually provides real-time information about is it running late, how many passengers are on it, is it air conditioned, and so on. Or if there has been some sort of um, uh, incident on the train line, so um, it's not coming anymore, it's been canceled, or um, it's running like severely late. So here we've got um, somebody's putting the information they want to go from town hall to central. So the first stop is where you're leaving from, and the second stop is where you're arriving at. So um, your uh, departure and arrival. Um, and here you can see that there's a, a lot of different um, trains that go from town hall to central because they're two major stations. So there's one actually arriving now because the time is 3.23, running on time. And it gets to Central at 3.27, so a four minute commute. Um, if you miss that one, there's one coming in one minute. That leaves from platform two. So these leave from two different platforms, platform one and platform two. There's another one in three minutes from platform four, another one in four minutes from platform two, and so on. Um, here you can see the real time information on this um, circular key to Bankstown. Um, this is where you've got maybe a, an accident on the, the train line. It gives you a real-time um, status update. So here, um, this is actually the 806 train, but it's running 49 minutes late. So it's gonna arrive at um, 8.55, and that's in eight minutes. If I miss that, there's another one in 12 minutes, or, or four minutes after this, yep. Um, or there's also another one arriving at the same time. And if I miss this one, another four minutes, there's one here, which arrives at 9.03. And the last screenshot actually shows you um, real-time information again. So this is the, you know, the marvel of smartphones and um, greater computing power is that we have these um, icons here which show you where your train is on the train line. So it has kind of rendered these static timetables where you don't actually get an update. Um, there is a potential for misreading them. It has made uh, traveling around a lot easier, but it's still important to have those skills be able to read a train timetable or a bus timetable where it's just a paper or printed timetable. Um, particularly if you're moving, um, like maybe not to Sydney, but maybe going somewhere regional or to another country, um, or you, you don't have your phone, you have to rely on it. So it's still a good skill to have. So we've looked at buses and train timetables. Let's look at some airline information or um, times that uh, destinations of planes leaving from an airport. So this is slightly different. Some people might refer to this as a schedule rather than a timetable. They're very similar. Um, this is your departure information. So um, if you were to go to an airport, hopefully when things open up again, um, you've got your departures. So that's uh, planes that are leaving. So you're going somewhere and then you've got your arrivals. So that's bringing passengers to the airport. So if you're picking somebody up, for instance, um, here you've got flights for Sunday, June 2019. So this is obviously um, pre-COVID. And we've got the destinations here. So here I've got Singapore, that's where it's going to. Um, Tokyo, Haneda Airport, Glasgow, Austin, Texas, Rio de Janeiro, and so on. 
Um, then you've got the time of the flight here. So you've got um, 11.40 for this flight. Now, again, this is in 2,400 hours as well because um, you know international travel and you want to be really unambiguous about the time so nobody gets it wrong. So it's not a.m. p.m. time, it's our 24 hour time. Um, the next piece of information, which is extremely important for uh, catching a flight, is the flight number. So you want to make sure you're on the right flight number. Um, so that might be in a Qantas flight or a British Airways flight or an American Airways flight. Um, then it shows here, it actually shows you the information about, you know, whether you should go to the gate. Um, is the, you know, the flight closing? Is it boarding here? And lastly, it shows you the gate number. So the gate here is um, C53 if you're going to Munich. Uh, let's say you're going to Dubai, it's C54. Uh, so they're actually right next to one another. So today you're looking at mostly static timetables or printed timetables. That means that they're not moving, it's not um, electronic, it's basically a printed sign you might see at a bus stop um, or at a train station. Then tomorrow on Wednesday, um, I'm going to give you two activities, and that's uh, using websites to find out timetable information. And that's probably um, what more people would do these days than rather than just turn up at a bus stop and be like, okay, when does this bus arrive? They tend to plan their trips a little bit more. So I'm going to show you how to do that today rather than having a separate video for tomorrow. Um, so the first one here is uh, booking a bus trip or a train trip or a ferry trip around Sydney. Um, so I've gone to this uh, website, which I'll provide you a link with. Then I go to this plan um, tab here. Then what it asks me, it says, okay, so where are you going from? Where are you departing from? So I said, well, I'm going to leave from Ermington Shops here. Yep, so I put in Ermington Shops and it actually came up with Betty Cuthbert Avenue Shops, which is the right thing. So it's here on the map. Then I wanted to go to Parramatta Station. Yep. So um, here you can select the mode of transport. Um, you can either walk, which is an hour and 22 minutes. I didn't know that. Um, now, you, obviously, this is a public transport website, so you kind of want to choose public transport. Um, then it's going to take 11 minutes. Then it says the next bus is leaving in three minutes here. Yep, so that's the leaving time. This says the B and indicates that it's a bus. Uh, B and the, the bus number is the 501. Um, and it's actually got the arrival time, or the sort of departure time, and the arrival time again in 24 our time so it arrives at 1 14 p.m um, also even tells me the cost of that as well which is a standard cost um, you can change whether you're a pensioner or a child or a student um, and that obviously changed the overall cost um, if you miss that one it has the next one here I'm leaving in 25 minutes and there you go that, that one takes a little bit longer at the moment it's going to take 12 minutes possibly due to traffic on the right hand side here i can see all the stops along the way um, so it goes here. I think it actually stops at the front of our school, uh, which is here, um, all the way to Parramatta. And there you go. The other activity you'll do on Wednesday is about booking a travel itinerary, so including some flights. Now, th there isn't really an airline timetable as such um, because you don't just turn up at an airport and go, okay, what flight am I going to catch now? Like, when's the next flight to London? Um, you want to book it in advance. So it's probably more useful to actually use a booking website um, to get those skills and just sort of see how it works, see what it looks like. Um, so here we've got a booking website, which I'll give you the link to. I want to book a round trip. So that means that it's going um, from Madrid, which is where I'm leaving from, to London, and it's going to get me a flight back as well. So a return trip. I've got my departure date here and my return date. So I've got um, Monday, I arrive or leave from Madrid, sorry, and Friday I return um, from London. So that's when I have to leave London. Um, over here, you can actually select whether you want to have a direct flight. That means there's no stops along the way. It just goes straight there. You can have one stop, which is like a stopover where it stops at another airport, um, and then it takes you to your final airport. Then you can have um, two plus stops, which is like you have two airports in between obviously adds more time onto your trip. So here, um, I haven't even selected um, one of these. So I can see here, I've got some different airlines that are gonna take me there. I've got um, LOT Polish Airlines. And I think these are organized, not even organized by price. You can um, filter for that. It's just the first one that came up. 
Um, so here, this leaves from Madrid at uh, 1535. So we've got 24 hour time here again, or 335 PM from Madrid, and it's got the airport code. Then it actually tells me here the total flight time. So it's actually 18 hours and 50 minutes um, because it has this stopover in Warsaw, which is in Poland. Um, it's not really along the way. Um, so it means it's going to stop in at Warsaw, then you're going to have to wait there for quite a while. You might even have to get a hotel. Then it arrives at London Heathrow at 9.25 a.m. the next day. So you'll lose a lot of time uh, catching that one. Um, same down here, uh, this one, this Air France one, leaves from Madrid at uh, 16.40 or 4.40 p.m. from Madrid. Um, the total flight time is five hours and 40 minutes. So it's a little bit shorter than that one. It's actually, you know, a third of the, the length. Um, it stops in Charles de Gaulle Airport in France, in Paris. Um, and then it arrives in London Heathrow at uh, 9.20 p.m. in the evening. So you'll be doing that, um, just booking some, um, you know, so you're basically your fantasy trip where you want to go. You can choose whichever airports. Um, obviously, you need to uh, book single trips all on the way. And then from your last destination, you, you're returning to your original destination, or original departure point, I should say. Um, all the instructions are there, but I thought I'd just show you this anyway. So when you go to it, you're not kind of lost. So just wrapping up for today, here are our main ideas. Uh, transport timetables often differ depending on the type of transport. That's because these have different kind of modes of transport and different uh, ways they function. So we saw the difference between the bus timetable compared to the train timetable, um, where the train timetable had those gaps where you had express trains not stopping at certain stops. Um, and then also the difference with the aeroplane timetable as well where we had stopovers happening and that increased the length of the flight. Uh, here we've got um, information that you need to look at when you're looking at transport timetables. So firstly, the departure point, where are you leaving from? is probably the most important information. Then the destination is your second most important piece of information. So where are you going? Um, if you're dealing with buses, you probably wanna look at the route number as well to make sure that it's going along the right route. Um, then you want to see the departure time and date, so what time is it leaving, and the arrival time and date, so what time does it get there, or what date does it get there. And then lastly, this part here, any conditions, for example, with the express trains or with the stopovers or any other kind of conditions that um, might be attached, it might be an express service or a limited stop service, um, so you kind of really want to look at that, um, those kind of special conditions that might be attached to a particular um, time. And lastly, you know, it's important to have both printed and um, app and website timetable skills. So the printed timetables, not so relevant these days. Uh, they still exist. And if you go to a bus stop, you'll pro probably see um, a printed uh, timetable. Um, but we're kind of more reliant on apps and websites now or increasingly reliant on those. But it's good to have both of those skills. All right, that's it for timetables this week. I'll see you on Thursday for lesson four. We're going to look at timelines. Okay, welcome to lesson three for year six maths for week five. We're moving away from timetables today and looking at constructing or making timelines. So today you're learning to make or construct timelines. Uh, to do this successfully, you need to understand that timelines order events chronologically, similar to timetables. So that's from um, uh, earliest to latest. Uh, accurately position events on a line. So a timeline uses a line and we position those events along it, as we'll see later in this lesson, and choose a suitable scale for making a timeline, which we'll also look at. So what does a timeline look like? Well, there are many different styles of timelines. Uh, here's a very simple one. Now, this is actually quite interesting because the timeline, um, it's a line, but it's also on a diagonal for some reason. It's a 24-hour timeline, and you can see it starts at 12 noon, so midday, and then it goes to 1 p.m., 2 p.m., and so on, until the middle midpoint is midnight, which you can actually hear, and then it goes on into the early hours of the morning. So this is... Uh, what this person is doing in this day. It's just basically a timeline of 24 hours, what can happen in their day, um, recording what happened. So uh, they drove to their cousins, 
they drove home at nine o'clock, went to bed, um, woke up at seven, watched TV at eight, and then had breakfast at 10. Yep, so a nice simple timeline. So timeline can be you know, over years, it can be over centuries, over um, hundreds of thousands of years, or it can be over a fairly short amount of time, um, like you know, 24 hours, maybe within an hour as well. Um, and there are events that have happened as well. So a timeline is like a record of events that have happened. Compared to a timetable, which is more about, you know, this is when something happens um, on a regular basis, a timeline is just, you know, this has happened, this is history. Okay, so let's look at another timeline. So I've just done one here, which is kind of a standard timeline on a horizontal line. And it's a time stone of milestones in my life. So here you can see that there are years on the timeline, these intervals, um, and there are intervals of five years. So 1980, 1985, 1990, and so on. And along that I've plotted milestones, so important moments in my life. So here you can see I was born here in 1983, started kindy in 1989, finished primary school in 1995. And you'll see that these years kind of match up. Now this is actually um, to the month as well. So it kind of goes a little bit beyond. Um, ideally, you probably just want to keep it to the year, but yeah, finished primary school in 1995, finished high school in 2001, which is sort of between uh, 2000 and 2005 and so on. So really just accurately plotting uh, these events along a timeline. Now, why not just kind of put these in a list, like a written list? Well, a timeline is really useful because it actually shows us visually um, the difference um, or the, the space or the span between different events. So you can see here um, that the point that I finished high school here uh, in 2001, it's kind of like the midway point, I suppose, of my life to this stage. Um, it's sort of halfway between when I was born and halfway where we are now in home learning. Um, whereas when I uh, say I bought a house, it's probably closer to um, home learning than it is to when I finished university there. Yeah. So it's actually a really uh, useful uh, visual tool. Um, and that's why it's important to make sure that when we're using it, we space out uh, these key events um, uh, accurately. So they're not all just sort of bunched together and it's like, oh yeah, you know, um, all the dates are gonna bunch together and there's random spaces between these years. We wanna make sure that this, the years are spaced out. Now I'm gonna show you a much simpler example. Um, so this is a tool that you can use when you're doing your activities for today, if you like, there's a website I provided a link. It's a nice and easy way to do it rather than having to write it on paper or try to do it into a uh, Google Doc. But if you want to do it in a Google Doc, here's also another simple way of doing it. It's kind of making a table and then plotting the years along here. So this is a nice, simple timeline. Um, and this is a timeline of PlayStation consoles um, by their release years. Uh, here you can see that um, it actually has a scale. So this is really important for when we're doing our timelines. We want to make sure that these years are spaced out evenly or the, the months are spaced out evenly. So here I've used a scale. So each one of these uh, rectangles represents one year. So the first one is in 1994, that's PlayStation 1, that was PlayStation. PlayStation 2 is in 2000, PS3, 2006, and so on. And you can see that the line here connects to the year. Um, again, it's a really useful way of kind of visualizing, you know, the time between uh, these events happening. So you can see here, and also just a nice way to quickly calculate. So here you've got uh, 1994 to 2000 is kind of six years. Again, another six years between 2000 and 2006. But then here there's a little, isn't a year longer. So PlayStation 4 came out a year later than the normal cycle. So it came out seven years. And again, they've gone to another seven year cycle here between 2013 and 2020. Um, so make sure when you're doing your timetable today that you use a scale. It could be like this. It could be, you know, one centimeter equals one year or um, one month, um, whatever your timetable is trying to communicate. Um, here are some other ways you can represent timetables. They don't always have to be horizontal like this one in the middle. Um, they can be vertical. So you can start uh, 
you know, with the um, earliest date at the top and keep working your way down to the bottom to the most recent. Um, you could also do it like this as well, this kind of snake format or a kind of curve. Um, we saw that that person before had a diagonal line. It's, it's really up to you. I don't really like this snake style because it's actually your eye has to kind of fold it around and you don't really see that nice kind of linearity like here. You see, you know, this is the earliest date as we read from left to right. Um, I kind of tend to prefer the horizontal ones because you, you know, you read from left to right, so why not kind of organize the information that way? But this is probably maybe the second sort of preference for me. Now here, this is considered a timeline, um, but compared to the timelines that I presented before, it doesn't actually have a scale. So it's really just um, a list of events. Um, so this is a history of earthquakes in Japan, uh, 1923. Now it gives us information, it gives us a date, it gives us the name of the city that it happened in and the magnitude of the earthquake, but it doesn't actually have that kind of spacing. So if this is a, a um, a scale, then we can say, oh, that's 10 years, but then that's not 10 years between uh, 1933 and 1946, that'd be 13 years, but it's the same space, so it's not really, it's not to scale. So it doesn't give us that extra visual information that a to scale timeline gives us. And the last one I thought I'd show you is this video game timeline. Um, this shows the kind of different generations of video games. It's not even up to date, I think it only goes to 2009. Um, now there's a lot of information happening on here and whether it's to scale or not, it's quite hard to see. But I just thought I'd show it, it is quite interesting. Like it's, you know, you could really kind of pour over this and spend a lot of time looking at this. Um, but I think today with your timelines, really just focus on making them clear and easy to understand, um, making sure you're getting that scale right um, and that you're, you know, you're accurately plotting the events um, on the timeline to the scale. And that's really the, the lesson for today, it's nice and short. So the main ideas today, timelines, they order events chronologically like a time uh, timetable, but you know, either horizontally, um, vertically, like you know, on a snake in a pattern or a, a horizontal uh, diagonal line. They're best drawn to scale. So you can decide the scale, um, you know, one box equals one year, one centimeter equals, equals one year. Um, we looked at this and the lastly, the most one of the most important things is it should, should be easy to read. Like any diagram or any graph that you're creating, um, timelines should be easy for the viewer to read. They shouldn't be ambiguous. They shouldn't be confusing or messy. Okay, that's it for today. One more lesson tomorrow about reading and interpreting timelines. See you then. Okay, so here's your last lesson for the week for maths. Lesson four for Friday, year six. Today we are looking at reading timetables. So yesterday we were making them or constructing them. Today we're just gonna be doing some quick, quick reading. So today we're learning to read, but we're also learning to interpret timetables. So what's the difference between reading and interpreting? Well, reading is just kind of scanning for information, but interpreting here is really making sense of the timetable as well. Um, to do that, you're gonna be able to determine the order of the timetable, so, you know, what's the chronological order, determine the scale of the timetable or whether it's to scale at all, find the time, date, year of events on the time, timeline, so depending on you know, how it's been sequenced, and calculate time between events on a timeline. So seeing how much time has elapsed between two events or two or more events. So this is our first timeline we're looking at. It's a horizontal timeline. Um, it's Cindy's timeline and it's been created by a student and it marks out you know, milestones or important events in her life. Um, now with a horizontal timeline, we generally read it from left to right, just like how we uh, read a page. Um, our eyes always automatically go to the left here and start reading this way across. So we wanna start with the earliest date, which is 2005. And then next one is 2006. So I can see that she's using years here. Um, now, if, if she decided to do it the other way, I could see it'd be 2006, 2005 perhaps, but it's always good just to check the order in which the timeline has been sequenced. And I've got a few questions here. So let's start off with the first one. In what year did Cindy go to preschool? Well, I'm gonna look at the events. So this is when she was born, when she could crawl, walk, first time went to the snow, Ah, uh, went to preschool. All right, it's been matched up, 2009. 
So our answer is 2009. And how many years were there between Cindy's vacation to Florida and her baby sister Carly being born? Well, she went to Florida here in 2011 and her baby sister Carly was born in 2013, just here. So there are two years. And lastly, how old was Cindy on July the 23rd? 2013. Well, we know she was born on July 23rd in 2005. So um, we're just basically finding a difference between those two dates. And so that will be eight years. Because 13 minus 5 is 8. Now, this hasn't actually been drawn to scale. Like it's spaced out you know, fairly evenly. There are some, some bigger gaps. But also, I noticed that she's missed a year here. There's no 2010, possibly because it wasn't, you know, a milestone year for Cindy, nothing really happened there. Um, so this one hasn't been drawn to scale. So a second timeline is of the Super Mario game timeline, and it shows us all the different Super Mario titles. Now I know there's other titles as well, but these are the Super Mario ones, the main games, um, between 1985 and 2010. Um, now I'm starting from again from the left. So this is my earliest date and on the right at the very other end is the latest date so 2010. Um, now I can see immediately that this hasn't been drawn to scale um, so between 1985 and 1989 is a, a gap of four years but here there's a gap of two years and a gap of one year so it's not drawn to scale so don't immediately get that um, visual sense of uh, the time or between each of these years or each of these um, games being released. But it still gives me information, it still gives me valuable information, just doesn't give me that visual um, impression. Okay, so let's look at some of these questions down here. How many years before Super Mario Galaxy 2 was Super Mario Sunshine? Well, I've got to find Super Mario Galaxy 2, which is here in 2010, and then Super Mario Sunshine is here in 2002. Um, so we can roughly say there's an eight year difference. Yep, 2010, so 10 minus two is eight. Um, how many years between Super Mario Brothers 3 and Super Mario World were there? Typo. So Super Mario Brothers 3 is back here in 1991. And Super Mario World is just in the following year. So there's only one year difference. Uh, which is the oldest Super Mario Brothers game on the timeline? Well, I go all the way to the left to the start of it. So it's this one, it's the original, the OG, Super Mario Brothers. And lastly, is this timeline to scale? No, as we just discussed over here. Okay, now here's the last timeline we're going to look at today. Um, this is a 24 hour timeline. So this is um, September the 5th, 2015, and it's this character, Paul Lee, and he had a fairly productive day. So it's all the, the random things he does in the day, or you know, not necessarily random, but the things that he would normally do in a day. Um, so let's look at some of these questions. So what did Paul do straight after 12 p.m.? So here, the, the timeline starts at 12 a.m., so at midnight, and Right here in the center, I can see 12 p.m. So what did he do straight after 12 p.m.? Well, there's a line here connecting it, so I'm going to go here. Um, and he's actually done a few things after uh, 12 p.m. Um, so he did his teeth here at 12.12, 12, did his uh, shaved at 12.19, washed the dishes at 12.27, and browsed Facebook at 12.55. Um, so here it would be brushed teeth. So. Yeah, actually, um, this is quite an interesting timeline because um, within this hour here, this um, 12 to 1 o'clock, I suppose, uh, we've got four different events happening. And so it's sort of branched out like this. But we can see there's the extra added detail of um, the times, the specific times. And so it's brushed teeth. What was the last thing that Paul did in the day? Well, 
um, if this is the start of his day at 12 a.m., then this is going to be the end of his day um, here. So it's sort of 12 a.m. the next day. Um, but nothing's happening there. There's nothing connecting that. Um, so here I can see this line connecting here at, at 11 o'clock. Um, so at 11.55, you read a textbook until 12.16 a.m. the next day. So that's the last event that he did um, on his fairly productive day. Okay, roughly how many hours were there between Paul waking up and eating dinner? Well, Paul wakes up, um, I've got to find it, it's actually quite small, um, here at 10.15 a.m., like you, Paul, and between eating dinner, so let's just say we're just doing it to the hour, so um, uh, 10 to 12 is three hours, plus another eight hours, because he eats dinner here, is 11 hours. And number four, each rectangle represents, um, so we've got, this one actually is drawn to scale. So each of these um, rectangles represents one hour. So that's the hour, I suppose, between five and six, six and seven, seven and eight, and so on. Um, apart from these end pieces, which I guess are just sort of to bookend the timeline, the rest is drawn to scale. And that's it for today. So our main ideas about reading and interpreting timelines. Uh, firstly, just determine the chronological order by checking the dates. So ideally, if it's a horizontal timeline, you should be reading it from left to right. Um, the left side should be the earliest date and the right side should be the latest date. Um, and everything is ordered in between, um, but it's always good to check the dates as well, just in case somebody has decided to do something a little bit different. Um, likewise with a vertical timeline as well. So usually the topmost date is the earliest and the bottom date is the latest. That's because we usually read left to right, top to bottom. Uh, if you're reading on a timeline here, so let's say it's our timeline, and we've got you know our events here, our uh, dates. So I say this is 2010, 2012, or 2011. Sorry. Um, make sure you find the events. Say so there's an event here, and which one it connects to. So it might connect to this one here. Yeah. Uh, lastly, just see if there's a scale. So the scale will give you an idea of you know like a visual idea. Um, but I wouldn't rely on it to calculate the time between events, unless that's the only information you've got. Instead, the timeline should include either times, dates, or years um, attached to each of the events, um, and you use that to calculate the time or the difference between different events. Um, it's much more reliable than uh, using the scale, um, because it either might not be drawn to scale, um, or you might miscount as well. Okay, that's it for this week, guys. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I'll see you next week. Have a wonderful one.